Back everyone inside Wagner Valley Brewing Company. We were thinking about maybe going outside, but uh, then it started raining sideways, so best to come back inside. And as I said, it is Wagner Valley Brewing Company, not Wagner Vineyards, which means we are talking beer today and doing so with Eric Norson again. Hi, how's it going guys? Eric Norson, of course, the head brewer here at Wagner Valley Brewing Company. Now, before we dive into a really interesting subject that I think wine lovers and beer lovers will find very interesting. Uh, just want to go over the housekeeping things. Uh, as per usual, I know we've talked before about kind of the ongoing situation and how we're trying to handle scheduling of events and things like that. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, New York today, um, certain regions that met certain criteria entered phase one. Finger Lakes region here, we are in phase one, which is excellent news. It's great. All good so far. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed, knocking on wood that everything stays like that because we are in phase three. And what that means is to get to another phase, you, it's at least a two week wait uh, and continuing to new criteria, continuing down the checklist. So the earliest that we can open back up the earliest, again, would be June 12th. Uh, we would love to be there at that date to welcome you guys back. We'll have a lot of new protocols in place, which we will keep you up to date with. Uh, unfortunately, pub night does not fall into what we'd be able to do in phase three. That would actually be phase four. So looking at the calendar again, uh, hopefully if all goes well, pub night is just two weeks after. Uh, but again, you know, we have to see what stipulations there would be with that. You know, I don't think anyone uh, would think that it's going to be exactly how it was in the past. But of course, we will keep you up to date. But let's talk about what we have been up to. Uh, and a lot of that has to do here on the brewery side with Triplebach and the new release of that. So uh, before we get into that, Eric, what else is new in the brewery? What you been up to? Uh, doing a lot of uh, parts and maintenance kind of stuff, uh, tearing, about, tearing apart heat exchangers, getting those clean, you know. Uh, having to do, well, when we do the triple block, we have to do a total changeover on our bottling line because they're in these quite marvelous bottles here. And uh, so we, our bottling line's normally set up for 12 uh, ounce bottles. These are a, I think it's 20, 25.4 ounce bottle. Um, so yeah, it's a kind of a challenge. It's one of those things that you do once a year and usually starting it up the first time is Usually a challenge, so because you know maybe something got missed, but I'm trying my hardest not to do that. You know, so uh, been doing a lot of calibrating with that uh, right now. Excellent, yeah. So 750s, uh, pretty similar. If if you're a wine drinker, you know this bottle size uh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully you have one uh, with you if you were able to order ahead. If you live in New York, we were able to ship it to you, uh, and you can take a look at both the new release uh, and the 2019 release. Now something. You know, really what the main crux of this discussion today is going to be about aging beer. Yep. What is, how does beer age similar to wine? How does beer age different from wine? Should you age beer? What type of beer should you age? Uh, so we have here a vertical tasting the past three vintages of Triple Bach, uh, 2020, 2019, and 2018. So wh what are our initial thoughts on how these are going to taste? So I guess just to start off, if you're at home and you have two bottles in front of you and you're wondering which one's which, the uh, 2020 batch, the label is a bit darker and then the top is a plain silver. And then the 2019, it is a lit, the uh, label's a bit grayer and then it is our old printed cap on there. So just a heads up, you know, and if you want to follow along at home, um, as for what happens with the whole oxidate, um, whole the aging thing, I mean, oxidation is the primary mover when it comes to a lot of these things. And oxidation, nine times out of ten, you don't want to see in beer, except for specifically high gravity beers and uh, typically uh, sour beers. So, like uh, down the road, there's Panabai Mixtures, which makes some fantastic low alcohol sours that you know age very well. Mm -hmm. But when you come to uh, this side of it. Um, typically, the beers you want to age are going to be higher alcohol. Um, you don't want much organic matter in that. So like an Imperial New England IPA, you're not going to want to sit on that as much because you have a lot of um, hot particulate and yeast in that. Okay. And oxidation of those kind of lend off bad mm -hmm. off flavors harder. Mm -hmm. That and also within like an Imperial New England IPA, you're going to want to have that fresh just so you get the freshest notes on the hops. 
But for this, these, we actually run it through a double filtration. It goes through diatomaceous earth filtration, then a sterile pad filtration. Say, say that one more time. Uh, Diet diatomaceous earth. Can you spell that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't. I'll actually, D I A T O M E C E O U S, I believe. Okay. If anyone's uh, at home, please Google that right <laughs> yeah, now. Let so us know I, in the comments. Let me know if I got that wrong. <laughs> Um, otherwise, I'll get the spelling bee trophy <laughs> tonight. Um, <laughs> I will have somebody go make one right now. Yeah. But yeah, it runs through a diatomaceous earth filtration. Diatomaceous earth, um, you'll know that mainly from pool filters. They, okay. it's, um, it's, it's actually uh, a, when you harvest or mine diatomaceous earth, it's an ancient uh, seabed. So diatomic uh, um, diatoms are a, uh, they're a, uh, single cellular organism in the uh, ocean. Okay. And they actually have like a, a silica based kind of backbone. And it's kind of looks like, if you look at it under a thing, it looks like a kind of like a porous beach ball with spikes. Wow. Yeah, so like over millions of years, you have all these diatoms dying and settling, and then you have all these layers, and eventually they get kicked up on top of the earth. So a lot of your di diatomaceous earth is coming out of Australia and uh, Nevada area, wow. typically. Um, so like des desert areas? Yeah, desert yeah, area? exactly. Yeah. Okay. Things that are like ancient uh, seabeds that okay. are kind of, yeah, up and out there. Um, but yeah, um, so then we run it through there because this, because a uh, cool thing about that is because it's all porous and everything. It's just, you catch all your yeast and everything on it because like a diatom, uh, diatom's uh, skeleton is about the size of a yeast particle. So it just makes like the perfect medium for moving things through it. And uh, um, real, there, real quick, Megan, uh, faithful viewer, Megan. Hi, Megan. How you doing? Uh, di she spelled it out here for us. D a d i a t o m a c e a c e. I guess I win the trophy by default because. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, all right. Thank you. <laughs> so close. But anyways, um, but yeah, once we go through the diatomaceous earth filtration, it goes through a sterile pad filtration. So you're knocking out a lot of the organic matter and it just makes a, a really great beer for, uh, um, for long-term aging. Um, so oxidative notes, what you pick up on these, uh, considering we're dealing with a lot, like not super dark malts. If you, if you run into a lot of like uh, roasted malts, some of those as they age out, they get kind of a soy saucy kind mm -hmm. of a, aroma and flavor um depending on who you are like my girlfriend like can't have most dark beers because she just it's soy sauce to okay her. but uh like uh this actually when as it oxidizes um a lot of the alcohol notes kind of die down they just mellow right out and then um, some of the malt notes they kind of pick up this kind of chocolatey aroma kind interesting of, yeah it kind of turns towards that end yeah awesome well i have a lot more questions about storage and capping and all that stuff Absolutely. but let's uh, see, I spell better after I've had a couple drinks, so <laughs> let's dive right into the 2020, I think is yeah. where we want to start. Start off with 2020. Uh, very recently bottled, right? Very recently, uh, a week and a half ago. Two weeks ago? <laughs> Megan is admitting she did not know how to spell it. She looked it up. That's fine. <laughs> you know, hey, hey, you know, the great thing I mean, about the internet. Thank you for settling that uh, discussion <laughs> anyways, yes. you know? Very I think that's one of the rules on the internet. If you want the right answer, always post the wrong answer. Oh, you know, you someone will let you know. So, <laughs> you'll get well actually. All right. No, very helpful. And Thank if you, you are, let us know uh, what you're drinking tonight, where you're watching from. Uh, it doesn't have to be Triple Bach. It doesn't have to be Wagner Valley or Wagner Wines. Just let us know. I'd like to hear from everyone. I'd like to know everyone's doing well. Uh, but this uh, 2020 Triple Bach Reserve right here, uh, just a, a beautiful color. Like a nice dark amber. It's nice and clean. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of kind of just, it's malty up forward, a lot of kind of molasses notes. But without caramel. being syrupy. Yeah, without being syrupy. Yeah, exactly. And this is kind of the balance. You want to like a malty kind of chewy, but you don't want to go too far on the end, you know? So what is happening when a beer, how do you find that balance? Uh, on the chemistry side of things on the chemistry side it's really um doing that it's a it's a matter of how you mash really um you basically shoot for like a target uh play-doh or degree bricks in the wine industry um and that's going to be your sugar concentration mm -hmm. and then you kind of go back to the uh the mash uh, mixer here and we actually do a step uh, mash process in a lot of our beers 
which uh, is actually becoming a hot thing, which is pretty cool because we've been doing it forever, yeah. you know. Not to say that, you know, we're cooler because we did it first, but, you know. But definitely to definitely. say that. Um, <laughs> um, but, yeah, um, going through the step process, you're kind of targeting what um, enzymes are running through the mash. Your two big enzymes are alpha amylase and beta amylase. And um, no one's spelling those. No one's felt I can do it. <laughs> but, uh, right, you're setting yourself up for this. Next I time. know. I just yeah. want to prove myself. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, your primary two uh, enzymes are alpha amylase and uh, beta amylase. And uh, you're looking, um, those uh, basically ch uh, chunk down uh, bigger uh, starch molecules into smaller, uh, you know, uh, mono and disaccharides, which are more available for yeast to uh, eat. So basically, by finding that balance in your mash temperatures and going through a step, you're able to kind of aim for this target of final gravity. Mm -hmm. And this uh, for very, very similar to, to winemaking, right? In yeah. terms of you know yeast, you know what yeast strain you're going to use, uh, whether it be inoculating or using wild ferment, you know wild yeast. Uh, the end goal here, if you're trying to make a dry wine, is you need all of you know it needs to go and eat all of that sugar and produce alcohol. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, speaking of yeast, actually, uh, so one of the differences I introduced with this batch, I mean, so this is the neat thing here, actually, with 2020 through 2018, this represents three different brewers. I brewed 2020, Eric Byers uh, brewed 2019, and then uh, Brent, I'm sorry, Brent, uh, Wojnowski, um, uh, it brewed the 2018 batch. So uh, it, it's kind of, it, it's kind of a cross section of different brewers. Um, how we were able to handle it. One of the things I did uh, personally was I added a bit more yeast to our bag, my batch. Um, that being that, you know, you kind of want the yeast to be, it's the analogy I can put to it is like you and five friends got to eat 20 pounds of food versus you and 15 friends got to eat 20 pounds of food. If you and five friends eat 20 pounds of food, you're going to be gassy, bloated, all sorts of, Fair. you know not feeling too great, but you and 15 friends, you're gonna move through that pretty quickly and you're gonna not feel so awful at the end. That's at fair. At the end of the day. That's fair. And so definitely gave it a bit cleaner of a profile. And uh, yeah. Excellent. No, it tastes delicious and you know, yeah, just it's super clean and wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can get your hands on this now, if you're in the state of New York, uh, and we go to a commenter who is in the state of New York, Diana, who is in Brooklyn, drinking 2019 triple box there you go that's going to be the next one we dive into she her question though um could you further explain what beer gravity is uh, specific gravity um specific gravity it's uh pretty much you're just um that's a term for the sugar content um so i i forget the exact actual, actual correlation but it's like um uh gram sugar per um liter of you know, liquid, because uh, in bricks, how how does bricks run again? I forget. Uh, I mean, it runs in degrees, but yeah. in terms of the the formulation for that, but basically what it boils down to is it's it's a reading. Um, you can use a hydrometer, re mm. re refractometer, refractometer. Uh, yeah, refractometer, refractometer. When you start off, uh, yeah. those yeah. aren't too great when you get alcohol involved. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the the whole thing is throughout the process testing as yeah. you, you're just testing as the sugar is being converted into alcohol. Exactly. Yeah. Sounds good. So you mentioned the closure. That is a question that I have. You yeah. would go with the crown cap. Now, some beers, you know, that are served in 750s, you'll see maybe like a champagne style topper with cork. Oh, absolutely. With uh, a wire, uh, you know, wire cage. And now, is that, is that just a difference in terms of how it's going to age? There's going to be more oxygen into there or? Uh, I mean, there's always the opportunity, of course. Um, I honestly personally won't do that because uh, it's, Probably a huge pain with our corker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, absolutely. Getting that, excuse me, uh, converted over. Um, but yeah, you can see a bit. Um, typically, with the the corks on them, I I've only really seen them in like really special edition beers and mm -hmm. um, and uh, the occasional like sour beer uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, I, I feel like also like European beers a yeah. lot. Yeah. And and a lot of the time it's you know it's it's similar to to wine again. It's old world. And, you know, you see it and you think it's this extra level of prestige or anything. Yeah, and then you exactly. really learn about it. It's like, no, it's just because that's what they've been doing for 100 years. It doesn't mean it's better. Yeah, because right? <laughs> they have the equipment and they don't want to <laughs> update it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, excellent. All right. So yeah, let's um, let's jump to to 2019 then. Yeah, 2019. Say, I want to pour a little 2020 left into mine, Absolutely. so I can, can do, do some side, side by side. Absolutely, that's the word that we were talking about. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, okay. So we we both we have kind of our own checklist here. I, I'm trying not to say um as much, which is that's even just saying it is another knock. And Eric felt he said absolutely too much last time, which I countered and said it's very positive. I'm fine with you saying absolutely <laughs> because the other alternative is you saying no a lot, and you know that's no fun. So I'm all right with absolutely. All right. So 2019. So here, um, oxidation can uh, darken beers a bit as well. So. Uh, Okay. Did you see a slight shade? This is a bit more in the ruby tones, it kind of looks like. Definitely, you get a bit more reddish out of that. Mm -hmm. I do feel like I'm getting a little more chocolatiness yeah, a little, on the nose. Definitely even. much more chocolatey. There is, it's definitely oxidative aroma in there. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it presents itself as a chocolate aroma, not like, um, so one of the bigger descriptors for it, I mean like oxidation and like, if you were drinking just a Budweiser, it kind of comes off as like a cardboardy kind mm -hmm. of flavor, but it really depends on the style of beer and everything. Budweiser tasting like cardboard. No idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but yeah, that's nice. So you can see how the the alcohol has mellowed out quite mm -hmm. a bit. You did get like just at the slight edges of sharpness on the 2020. Mm -hmm. And that's what you'll see as this uh, ages out. I mean, like me personally, when we released Triple Buck, my favorite time to have it is like about four months after we release it yeah. that's like you know your first cold night of fall mm -hmm. i think is the perfect time and the alcohol is mellowed out really mm -hmm. well at that point yeah it is similar to an Oktoberfest in mm -hmm. a way and but i feel like there's just so much more depth here like, yeah absolutely but it's it's very similar when you talk about kind of that that uh edginess it's it's similar i'm always going to bring it back to wine because that's what i do but uh, it's similar to acidity, right? And, yeah. and you know, when you're aging a wine like Riesling, that acidity, part of what makes it so age worthy is having that acidity. But then as it gets older and older, that acidity kind of balances a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, just softens becomes softer. Out around yeah. the edges. Absolutely. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the history of Triple Bach here at Wagner. I know, you know, as we mentioned with three different brewers, you weren't here at, at its inception, yes. but. Uh, it seems like it's always been a beer that Wagner's really yes, hung his hat on. I'm not sure the first year we actually had it. Um, it uh, was developed under Dean Jones when he was during his tenure here. Um, so I do know that in 2003 it won GABF Gold, uh, Great American Beer Festival. Uh, 2004 it won TAP New York Gold. And then in 2004 as well it won the World Beer Cup. So quite a big uh impressive beer uh, it has its pedigrees definitely it's um it's definitely a heritage beer excellent excellent so this is one where you know obviously you're able to come in and and, and tweak a lot of different things I maybe mean, make your own mark is this yeah. one that you found you you made a lot of tweaks to or have you kind of kept it uh um, not super as i said just adding more yeast to it mm. um the only other tweak that i did is um i actually changed the uh the sanitizer we used on the tank, which uh, some people that may sound like such a mundane change. Um, you, can, you can count me in that group for now, but you can convince me. Actually a huge thing. Um, so traditionally for sanitizer, what we used was a uh, chlorine dioxide based uh, sanitizer. Um, and the difficulty with that, um, chlorine dioxide is probably your kind of nuclear bomb of sanitizers, like um, because basically what it does is um, when, when you're using it to sanitize a tank, we add acid to it and it gets into a gaseous phase. So you're basically just filling your tank with chlorine gas and then, um, and then you try to rinse it as much as possible. But the problem with chlorine and beer, you're always stripping chlorine when it comes into your water source. So like our beer gets carbon filtered to knock all the chlorine out. You don't want chlorine in beer because chlorine re reacts with phenolic molecules um, and creates uh, chlorophenolic molecules which um uh this which, is definitely not something i got right on a chemistry test at one yes point definitely life. but if you wanted a great example of a chloral phenolic uh um molecule uh it is a uh um, chloroseptic chloroseptic is the uh if you're on the cheap want to make a beer full uh kit mm -hmm. they tell you to buy a, a bottle of chloroseptic rather than getting a lab tested thing so it's kind of that kind of that like numbing kind of tingly kind of thing 
and that can show up a bit early on in the beer, um, but it mellows out uh, if it's in, I mean, it's typically in really low levels in our beer, but I'm somewhat sensitive to it, so I switched it over. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, um, and now we use uh, parasitic acid, which is uh, much more cleaner. All right, so now with less chlorine. Yes, less <laughs> chlorine involved. <laughs> But yeah, this is a delicious beer as well. Absolutely. Uh, Joyce Wood uh, commenting, saying hi. Uh, really interested in the chocolate notes that we mentioned, saying yum. That's, uh, hey, age your beers. Exactly. Age, age, your, uh, age the right beers, and you're going to start got, to get We more got of that. quite a few cases of this. Um, we can ship a case of it to you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, she's up in Maine, so oh. we, uh, I believe, uh, you know, Deb Wagner, when she, when she heads back, I believe there's some relation there, so she can uh, yeah, come bring go. some triple <laughs> Uh, do, 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 do. All right, Paul asking a pretty basic question here. Why the name? What does Triple Bach mean and why is it named that? Um, I, I honestly at first thought it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek joke uh, that it's one more than a double Bach. It, it's uh, thus a Triple Bach, but it's uh, legitimately a style. Um, and it's uh, basically just kind of denotes that it's on that upper edge above. It's similar to a double Bach, but it's one more <laughs> <laughs> when will the quad bach be out that's I mean, really what i would like we to can know. we can do it let's do it let's make a 12 percenter all let's right just... <laughs> well i was i, I was like, talking let's with do it. i was talking with eric before about so eric worked at harpoon in uh yep. in boston and i i lived in boston probably at the same time we yeah think likely probably overlap, overlapping yeah. but one of my favorite beers there was the arctic ale which is what 14, 13, it's Oh yeah, yeah that was up really there. up there. And uh, uh, yeah, I actually had a hand in making that. That was, uh, that was quite the brew day, because um, Arctic Ale was, the cool thing was Arctic Ale kind of looked like this. Um, it was just a dark and heavy beer, but it was literally all two row and they just boiled it for 10 hours, I believe it was. I remember certain Serpy characteristics. Yes, uh, it was uh, a... <laughs> Very. Yeah, but you got there in the end. It was still a pretty tasty beer. Absolutely. Uh, Jason loves Triple Box so much that he went caps lock on love, and we love that. So cheers to you, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Um, oh, hold on here. And he said he wished he had one left. Well, we can, if you're in New York, we can get you one. Absolutely. Uh, if you're somewhat close by to New York, uh, starting June 12th, you can come and you can get one. Well, you actually can come now and get one. You yeah, we'll meet you at the door. Here. Yeah, if you want to just do curbside pickup, we can get that for you. He's also drinking right now a rebrand of the new Empire Scotch Ale with coffee called Local Grind. Ooh. So it's a little bit of coffee. You'll be staying up late tonight. <laughs> uh, Deb confirming Joyce is her lovely sister-in-law. So oh. hi, Joyce. Thank you for tuning in again. So I'm really interested to try the 2018. Yeah, I am too. Um, I had a bottle last week just to make sure things were in line. Excellent. So uh, fingers crossed that this bottle's <laughs> no, in line no, as well. <laughs> no <laughs> spit buckets needed. Uh, Absolutely. Right. Hey, uh, how often, I mean, do you drink aged beers often or how far back? Do not you... super often. I try to stay away from drinking too heavy of beers at home. Like, yeah. I like drinking Pilsners and a lot of, a lot of Modelo. Um, okay. That's why I look forward to bringing back Seneca Soul. Yes. That's just an excellent Mexican lager. Our plans are still to have that packaged this summer. So um, if you like a Mexican lager or if you need to be convinced to like a Mexican lager, we've got Seneca Soul for you. I can convince you. <laughs> and even if you don't care about the taste, aesthetically, the look of that can is going to be something Oh, yeah, else. absolutely. Um, a couple of people here at Wagner actually designed that can. So it's very, very exciting. Really hoping. Uh, you know oh. that we'll be able to release that in a in the festive atmosphere that it is meant to be enjoyed in. So, but now we're looking at 2018 triple box. So you know Eric talked a little bit about how oxidating will lead to darker color, and I'll do my best here. You know, let me pour a little it's more. Really a little chill haze on this guy. So okay, that's a uh, chill haze. That must be an, an industry term there. Yeah. So uh, it's a beer, pretty so chill haze, brah. <laughs> chill haze, brah. Um, but yeah, uh, basically, uh, when you have a uh, chill haze is basically a hydrogen bonding behind between like uh, phenolic compounds, which are common in beer, and um, basically it brings them out of precipitation. So this looks a bit hazy right now. Give it a minute to warm up, and it'll be crystal clear once again. Very uh, round, and, and definitely, I mean, you can yeah, taste. Yeah, there's. Definitely a strong chocolate, a lot of brown sugar into mm -hmm. that. 
but still aged pretty wonderfully. Yeah, it, it's not flat by any means. It's not flat. There's no there's no flabbiness to it. It's still uh, you know. Oh, it's delicious. And then this was uh this was the batch that we won uh bronze in the New York State uh, Brewers Association with that in 2019. Um, so that was that. this was that right batch. Here. So bronze in the beer world probably should be like gold because the color is pretty similar to bronze, right? Absolutely. That's what we call PR spin. <laughs> oh, that's delicious. So but yeah, it's much softer, definitely mm -hmm. all around. So storage, you know, in, in wine, when storing wine, there's a number of rules you got to follow if you're going to go yeah. closer to three years in terms of humidity and temperature. What would you recommend for storing a beer? I would recommend those same rules typically. Yep. 45 to 50 degrees, don't get too much in the temperature fluctuations. I'll be honest, uh, this, uh, <laughs> this bottle of 2018 is uh, kind of pushed because it's been in my breezeway for the last two years okay. and it's just sat there. Yeah. And that gets both the coldness of winter and then the harsh extremes of summer. Okay. So definitely I did not take care of this beer, but it's still held up, held up pretty well. <laughs> Maybe a couple years down the road, we might be say, saying a different story, but yeah. But the one thing, I mean, with the crown capping and, and wines that are crown capped or stealth capped also, you don't have to worry about the humidity as much because the humidity is really, uh, has to do with the cork expanding and yeah. contracting and a lot yeah, more. Yeah, once that starts to dry out and crumble, you're kind of running into trouble. Exactly. So this doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be sideways. Yeah, it doesn't have to be sideways. If you want it for aesthetics or you know for storage purposes, go for it. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. However, if you're just at like a gas station and you're checking out their beer selection, they have a three-year-old beer. Chances are. That yeah. they're not they're not keeping that because they're trying to age it for you. Yeah, it's just they haven't restocked in a while, so you got to be careful. Yeah, there's definitely some <laughs> gas stations out there where it's like where beer goes to die. So yeah. you know, keep an eye on things. <laughs> uh, fun side story: I was at a uh, I was in New Jersey at a at a wine store slash gas station, and I found like a 2002 Beaujolais wine, and I'm then this was like last year and i'm like there's no way yeah but i couldn't not buy it because you just never know i mean i know Bo yeah. beaujolais doesn't really age gamay doesn't really age that well anyways but i'm like why, why not give it a shot yeah the, the guy cashing me out didn't even couldn't even ring it up it like wasn't in the system oh, it was out of the system. so he's just like ah 15 bucks i'm like yeah fine and it was pure vinegar and <laughs> to this day, that smell still haunts me. So. Oh yeah, I mean, like I, I actually I take a scientific approach to it, and like I'll flat out say like, hey, who wants to go taste some terrible beer right now? Because I know it's aged, but I, I do want to taste, you know, where things are at. And I'm pretty regularly tasting our stock in here and uh, making sure everything's on key. But you know, yeah. occasionally you run into those <laughs> ones where you pop it, and it's like, yeah, that's. Uh, Best it's prime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we're obviously here making sure that that's not the case when you come in and buy your beer. Absolutely. Don't, don't you worry. Uh, Paul has another question, similar, um, I think, just taking on the context. So, does this basically mean Triple Bock is just a higher alcohol, higher alcohol? Yes, Doppelbach. for the most part. Yeah, just a higher alcohol um, version of Doppelbock. I mean, the, the it's a very similar recipe. Actually, our Triple Bock gets about uh, twenty pounds of uh, honey in it as well. Mm -hmm. Which kind of pushes helps push a, an additional slight floral note to it. Interesting. So yes. that yeah, that's just helping create more depth. Create yeah, more exactly. Profile. And like honey is very readily fermentable by yeast, so um, it's kind of like just pouring white sugar into it. You know, it's just yeast is going to eat that right up. And from that twenty pounds of honey you're putting in, you're probably getting a one degree Plato boost out of it, and you just know that the yeast is going to eat through that. So that gives you a heads up head start very interesting very interesting well uh we do have another glass here as i'm sure many people notice we do have another can here uh as well so let's not keep the people in suspense any longer what what else do we have here that we're going to taste well we're going to just throw this in as a wild uh, little dessert beer thing um we got a can of fossenbach uh fossenbach is our sled dog doppelbach aged in bourbon barrels Last year we did it for six months. This batch has been in a bourbon barrel for one year. Wow. Um, it's very bourbony. Um, it's got bourbon notes with a uh, bourbon flavor. And uh, 
Yeah. And maybe some bourbon chocolate. A little well. bourbon, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, it's um, it, it's this another one that it, it can age out pretty well, but also you kind of want to watch out with it, just because with barrel aging, it's kind of a crapshoot. Ideally, everything went right. If we put it in the can and something went wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to honestly know the difference. You're going to have to tell me. But uh, Diana has a question here about how do we come up with the bottle label designs, both for, for our wine and our beer. So I guess you can take the beer side, and I will uh, I'll um, take the wine side. I pass that off a lot. Uh, a lot of that is passed off to <laughs> other people. Uh, uh, Debbie Wagner uh, kind of set us up for uh, the triple box labels. I'm, she may have uh, had a hand in uh, or did the, the uh, original one here, but these ones have been really fantastic, and she set that up. I believe Eric Byers kind of gave the recommendation on like doing the kind of kind of has that Louis Vuitton look to it with the, yep. the uh, repeating. You, you're patterns. not going to be able to see it from here, but it's the Wagner Valley logo kind of in uh, imprinted into the into the grayness that you see there uh, as well. And yeah, I mean on the wine side. We did recently just kind of undergo a, a little bit of a rebranding from, from a couple years past, uh, just actually taking a lot of the color out of the label so it's a little bit more monochrome, uh, beautiful. The, really, the, the Seneca Lake in the background pops a lot better, and then uh, really working on, on kind of color coordinating um, at, as you look at both the cap and the label itself. So uh, I guess all of that to say it's a collaborative process for sure. Absolutely. And, um, you know, and I mentioned the Seneca Soul is, you know, designed by somebody here in house. Uh, we have many talented people and, you know, kind of one of the, the cool things about working here is, is that collaborative environment. I mean, we're able to, to bounce ideas off and, you know, you end up getting the best idea and we're really excited for that canning process and, and that canning to come out. But, you know, it's a, all in all, just a pretty, pretty cool suite of uh, labels that we have there. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, definitely looking great. All right, let's dive into this Fossenbach. Now, you said dessert wine. Is it sweet or no? No, not really. So yeah, it's uh, very heavy on the bourbon side. Um, uh -huh. The uh, mm -hmm. the Doppelbach mm -hmm. um, is actually a great match for bourbon barrels because bourbon has that kind of sweet kind of uh, note to it. And then our Doppelbach has just a really natural kind of cherry note to it. So they just meet each other like right in the middle perfectly. It is like crazy smooth. Like you, mm. yeah, it's. <laughs> In that bourbon way, like yeah, because you're, yeah. you're bracing yourself for it, given the you know all the aromas that you get as yeah. it's coming in, and then it just you go yeah, right. Yeah, it's through. like you know, it's like when you have your sipping bourbons. Um, definitely, this is kind of in that level. It's just a nice sipping beer. It it really matches the bourbon profile perfectly, and it's just something you can sip on. And yeah, it's high alcohol. And I was gonna say, what is what is the alcohol on this? It's um, so it's double box eight point six when we put it in there. It picks up a bit more of a fermentation just from natural yeast in the barrel. Um, so it's usually around nine-ish, nine-ish, okay. I'd call it, um, nine and a half. But yeah, it's um, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, it's certainly muted as if you compared to actual bourbon, but you definitely get that like right after you drink, you go. <sighs> yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. Something. Again, bringing it back to wine tasting, when you're if you're blind tasting a wine and you're trying to figure out alcohol, a good trick is to kind of do that, like kind of open up the back of your throat and breathe out and just kind of feel if you can taste that alcohol coming through and, and you have no issues. You have yeah, no issues you, you, with this. You one. catch it, yeah. So do you like do you sip this? Do you try to pair it with something? Um, I'd sip it. I, I typically, when I have it, it's usually a six to eight ounce pour of it. Um, we have 10 ounce glasses, so I'll do a bit shorter on that. Definitely not something I want to pound very quickly. <laughs> right, yes. It's definitely a saver beer. So is this something else? So this aged, as we mentioned, aged a year. Yeah. Where do you think this goes as it's aged, kind of age? I mean, I know we're, we're not bottling it. Yeah, that's a that's a rough one to kind of speculate on. Sure. Yeah. It's uh, we'll see. Um, I know. So we did Fossenbach way under uh, Brent's. Uh, uh, 
uh, under his when he was a, the brewer here. Mm -hmm. um, I remember just I was working retail here at the time and some guy said, uh, he's like, it tasted great. And then, you know, I sat on a can for six months and it didn't taste so great. But then another six months later, it tasted great again. And it's like, all right, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure what to do with that information. <laughs> That doesn't sound like a very yeah. scientific yeah, test. Yeah, exactly. To me. Um, Too many variables. Here. I, I would just see it rounding off and getting softer and softer. It does have slight. There's kind of an apple juice aroma to that, and I could see that dying out a hmm. bit. Um, we would actually prefer that to die out a bit. Okay. Yeah, I get that now. Martinelli's like, yeah, the, you're really uh, your your true apple juice. You know, yeah. like your your high yeah. sugar. Yeah. It is tasty though, don't get me wrong. It's wonderful, That's, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, where I'd like to see it is just kind of it softening out a bit, maybe a bit more of the vanilla character coming out and everything. And um, honestly, with the way things are going, so when I filled the barrels for this, I filled six barrels and then I only opened three of them. So our plan was in January, we're gonna open up the rest of the three. Okay. And those will have been in the bourbon for three, for two years. Wow. That's projecting, you know, how things go. We'll be back. We'll be yeah. back uh, in January and see how see how those go. And one of the things I've been speculating because we're working on them. I've since I've started. I guess uh, let, let's just further explain that. So the point being, because when you take them out, then the shelf life begins, right? Like these, the, pretty much those for the three most barrels. Part, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we um, want we want to preserve those other three. Yeah. Until, okay. The other you. thing I'm kind of speculating on, and we'll probably have to wait until things become normal again, is like. Maybe just like in the fall or something, because we have a lot of, uh, since I've started, I brought like a lot of barrel, mm -hmm. uh, kind of reinvigorated the barrel program here. So we have our uh, uh, Chardonnay, we have our Ghost of Mangoza, Fossenbach. Um, we have the the um, Ginned Up Trouble coming eventually. Once we run out of Fossenbach, we'll have Ginned Up Trouble coming, um, which is a our uh, uh, double that's been aged in a gin barrel for six months. Yeah, that's let's cool. let's tell the story of the uh, the original name. Terrible, <laughs> terrible trouble. <laughs> we initially was going to be called Terrible Trouble uh, as an homage to Charles Barkley. Yes. Uh, however, at the end of the day, we figured uh, a you may not know the Charles Barkley terrible joke. In which case, b we're just calling our beer terrible. Yeah. So we did have to change it. Eric came up with ginned up uh, trouble, which. Uh, makes a lot of sense given that it is yeah yeah barrels. exactly and the original beer was double trouble which you know exactly so yeah then we're getting into ginned up trouble but then we we have a few other things in barrels still hanging out right now so like I, i've kind of thought about like once we get back to normal maybe doing like an old beer night where like you know sell tickets and like we'll turn six of the taps over to just aged beers that we're sitting on and you know, bring people in and let you try like how these things age out. Sign me up. Yeah, exactly. That sounds like a great idea. So yeah, I've uh, I've got a small stash of uh, little sixels and uh, halves like for a lot of these things that I'm like sitting on, and uh, we'll see uh, how we can do that. In things the are percolating. Yeah. Talk to me about barrel selection. Uh, are you are you are you going out buying barrels? What are you what are you looking for? Um, we have we're lucky because we're in wine country, so we have some great barrels very locally. Our bourbon barrels, they're from FLX Distilling down mm -hmm. the uh, street. Um, our gin barrels we source from uh, Myers Farm Distillery, which is over on Cayuga Lake. They have a, um, so the really cool thing, actually I, I love our gin barrels that we source from them and like definitely go to Myers Farm, try their uh, spirits and everything. They're, um, I developed a taste for uh, barrel aged gin um, mm -hmm. when I was living on the West Coast. There's a brand called Ransom out there, which is just a fantastic barrel aged gin. Um, and so when I came here, like, and you know, Eric Byer was kind of like, well, you know, what do you want to do for a barrel program? Like, let's find gin barrels. Like, okay. let's do this. And mm -hmm. Eric, uh, he had known about Cayuga Gold over at uh, Myers Farm. That was one of his favorite drinks there. And um, Cayuga Gold is a. Um, so they run bourbon through the barrel first and then they do gin in the barrel. Interesting. And um, which is kind of different. I, I think a lot of the other gin producers, they're probably doing a rye or something. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it's definitely you don't get as much bourbon notes. But with with the Cayuga Gold barrels, you get just these notes of bourbon and like 
There's like cinnamon and vanilla and like all sorts of weird notes coming out of it. And it's just a fantastic blend for uh, barrel aging I've found. Um, so we actually do our uh, mangoza in there. Mm -hmm. Ghost of Mangoza is a, it's a uh, mango sour beer aged for six months in the gin barrels. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. That was like, so that was Eric Byer's idea. The story behind that was like, you know, I told him, let's get gin barrels. And then we we're kind of like, well, what are we going to do with this? And then uh, Eric's like, I'm going to put mangoes in there. And I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you putting this sour mango beer in there? I was honestly kind of like, like a galaxy brain. Yeah, idea he's there. like, I'm like, like, I'm like, I don't think this will work. I really don't think it's going to happen. And then when we popped that open, like, and had the first sips of it, like, it was so good. I was mad. Like, I was just like, we need to get this in kegs. We got to get it like in competition. Like, what are we doing? Yeah. Here? Like, it was just something so fantastic that, um, uh, like it's since then, it's just been like, yeah, we're doing this beer. Mm -hmm. Mangoes is ghost of mangoes is where it's at. And I mean, in the craft beer world in particular, like you always got to be trying new things. You yeah, always got to be finding something yeah. unique. Yeah, exactly. And you want to do wild card stuff, but like even then, like in my head, that was like, that's a bit too wild card for me. <laughs> but, but like the mango is a, with like the cinnamon notes and then the bourbon notes, it just comes off like a, like a kind of a whiskey sour with mango and cinnamon like kind of this mold taste and everything when, when's that coming out of you um, some of that? well we'll see yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like fair we we might actually have to put a pause on that for this year um we do have another barrel aged sour fair. that's sitting right now um True. and but um i got some six list downstairs you know if you want to try that <laughs> Keep that between us. Hey, if you're watching this video, <laughs> if you're watching this video, you're in the exclusive club. You, you get in touch with Eric. He'll make sure you have a you have a good time when you come out here, <laughs> or when you order something, and we'll send it out to you if you're in New York, at least, as well. Uh, run through a couple questions here from Paul, uh, just asking how long in the bourbon barrel. Uh, it's a year is what we're we're sampling right now. Yeah, so a year in the bourbon barrel right yeah, now. Yeah, another another. Uh, Potentially two years also, though. Down yeah, the uh, down the road, yep. Yeah, so at least one year. Uh, Jason also wants to know the percentage on the ginned up trouble. Ginned up trouble, I believe uh, the original was 8.5. Um, just from, I haven't, I, I got to do a, another gravity on that just to double check on it. I'd say it'd probably be shooting into the nine range, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, and to be totally honest, like, I'm I'm purely objective with my beers. Like you know, if you get me in a corner and ask me an honest for an honest question about our beers, I'll give you an honest answer. I wasn't a hundred percent in love with Double Trouble when I made it. I was mm -hmm. kind of disappointed. It wasn't the roundness that I wanted. When it came out of the barrels, it was like that's <laughs> what I wanted. Like it is so good. Like the the uh, what we described it Double Trouble as is being like it's almost like dr pepper because there's just so many flavors coming through there yeah like you know cherry notes like wintergreen notes all sorts of things and then when you add those barrel notes that bourbon that cinnamon to it it's just perfect it's like it's like it's like just go, say it it's going to like a hippie natural food store and getting like the off-brand cola china cola or something like that okay it's like herbal cola like you know there's cola notes on it there's cherry notes bourbon notes it's just fantastic herbal cola ladies herbal and cola guys so get out get, find your zen place yes. you know just just get some you mm. time I think that's very important during this isolation. Especially right now, self-care is important, guys. Find yourself some you time, get some of this, and just be. Yeah. <laughs> Zen. <laughs> Interesting. I, I, I want to dive a little bit more into that because the, the psyche of uh, a brewmaster, of a winemaker, patience is a virtue. And patience yeah, is... Yeah, definitely. It's more than a virtue. It is required, right? Yes. So, Rushing, I mean, planning and patience. Definitely, you got to plan things out and you got to have patience. If you try to rush things, things are going to blow up in your face. You're going to get diacetyl. You're going to get explosive cans and bottles and everything. So you got to have patience and you got to have planning. Definitely. I mean, in the last two days, I've basically been doing a lot of like calendar, trying to figure out where we're going to sit things up in the next uh, month and month or two as we open up, you know? 
Cool, cool. Well, get your questions in, guys. Let us know uh, any questions you have about the brewing process. Uh, you got the guy here who's going to be able to yeah, answer that. It ain't me. Answer a lot it's of It's this guy. <laughs> uh, did that come natural for you? I mean, is that something you just had to learn through, you know, year after year, kind of going through the process? I uh, learned what? Well, the patience and the ability to, to okay, mean, maybe it doesn't taste how I want it right now, but you know, hey, it could get there, so I need to be able to wait on it. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely, I, I learned that uh, pretty quickly. It was pretty embarrassing. <laughs> that, I mean, like, so when I worked at Harpoon, they, they pay for, I mean, they have homebrew systems in the building. You want to come in on a Saturday, drink a few beers, crank out a homebrew, and, mm -hmm. you know, share it with guys. Maybe we'll make a beer out of it. And I remember one beer that I kind of rushed through because I just, I, I don't know, I wanted to get it into... There was like one of the big, uh, bigger guys coming up from Boston. He was gonna be in Vermont. I just wanted. They to like have... beer in Boston. I'm, yeah, I, well, I it was tell you the, first. It was the management in Boston coming up to oh, Vermont. Oh, okay. All right, all right, I got you, I got you. And I wanted him to try it because I wasn't sure next time he'd be in there. And I rushed things, and it turned into a diacetyl bomb. And like that was kind of like my first message of like. And as much slow as down. diacetyl bomb sounds like a great heavy metal band yeah. name, <laughs> it's probably not something you want to ingest. Absolutely not. Um, diacetyl um, is a very common beer fall. Uh, um, it's butter. It's it's butter. Uh, it's literally, if you get butter... Now, wait a second, because as a big, avid Harry Potter fan, butterbeer is actually very popular. <laughs> so is that really all Harry's drinking? That's, I mean, yes, yes. <laughs> so I, I've seen as a few tell, branded things been, that were just... Been... <laughs> Continue. I, I've Are seen people a few actually... things that, like were branded towards that, like, oh, it's a butterbeer. It's like, ah, oh, that's terrible. Um... <laughs> pay J.K. Rowling some royalties, then all of a sudden your diacetyl yeah, exactly. bomb is marketable. <laughs> well, no one's really pouring, uh, paying royalties on those things. It's all uh, intellectual property theft. <laughs> Whole nother story. Not something we're doing here, obviously. No, we're trying to avoid that. You know, Frank and Weizen, you know, Frankenstein has nothing to do with this. Plus, that's entered public domain. That has entered, point. exactly. That's basically on Wikipedia now, thus it is in common use. Wow, we uh, we went to some places there. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, Jason asking what phase will tastings be available outside or inside? There are when they are available, they're all outside or inside. It's going to be together, uh, and it is going to be in in phase three of what Governor Cuomo has called Unpause New York. Uh, if if you're not familiar, we just entered phase one today. So woo, that's great. That's, phase one, guys. It's awesome. We're very happy about that does not mean that we are open for tastings, unfortunately. Because we have been deemed essential business, we are open for retail, though. You can come in, you can buy a growler. Uh, it has to be a new growler. You cannot refill a growler here, uh, one of the safety measures that we've taken. But you can buy a new growler. You can get cans, you can get bottles, you can get wine, you can get any t-shirts, anything that you want. Magnets, there's a lot of them, they look great. But for coming in for tasting, it is phase three, each phase is a minimum of two weeks apart. So we're looking at June 12th as the earliest that we could possibly open to welcome people back. Uh, we are still uh, fine tuning what, those, uh, what that strategy is going to be. And once we have that uh, completely figured out, we will let you know. Uh, and bear in mind, it is going to be all that we can do to make it the safest possible for both yeah. those who are coming in to taste as well as our staff who will be pouring for you. Yeah, uh, just keep an open mind. I mean, like, because it's going to be radically different from how we've done it in the past. I mean, when I work retail, this entire space would be filled. We're not going to be able to do that. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Capacities are going to be limited and uh, you, will, you will likely see some sort of reservation requirement uh, just to make sure that we can control those numbers. Uh, but, you know, assuming the weather is cooperating, that, that capacity, those reservations, they open up. As Wayne Talley is behind us, he's <laughs> as helping us. He's kind of like signing it. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, as we grow, as the weather gets better, we can have more people outside, which means overall we can have more tastings going on. Uh, pub night, as I'm sure a lot of you want to know, we still have to wait on that. That technically does not fall under phase three. Ginny Lee Cafe, Wagner Valley Brewing, and Wagner Vineyards all fall under phase three, but phase four is more those larger public gatherings. So we're at least two weeks after we open up here for tastings that pub night could be a thing. But again, we're expecting 
several regulations to come with that in terms yeah. of crowd size and spacing and things like that. So no matter what, we'll make sure you know if it's an acoustic set and everyone's just chilling on benches. Like, I'm cool with that at this point. Like, we just need to, we need to uh, be able to welcome people back in, and we're thrilled that we're going to be able to do that at some point. But we got to be patient, like a brewmaster, like a winemaker. We can't rush it. Because then all, all of a sudden we're looking at a completely everything lost over year. the last three months has been to waste if we rush it, you know. Oh, so Megan is is doubling in, is coming in and saying butterbeer is delicious. So <laughs> we uh, have a future in diacetyl. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, like I, I I working in a well going to school in Oregon State. I have friends that have spent time in wine industry as well, and we don't do it here. But for like Chardonnays, when you're talking about the Mal really big malolactic fermentation, yeah, well, the uh, barrel aged with the butteriness that mm. people people love with that barrel aged uh, love. I mean, yeah. there seems to be a kind of a pushback against that nowadays. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. Um, so yeah, California <clears throat> kind of reinvented Chardonnay. Yeah, uh, as a very oaky buttery uh, yeah. savory mouthfeel uh, with malolactic fermentation and with bar barrel aging as well uh yeah 100 there there is a pushback so we do a barrel fermented chardonnay here uh but when you talk about the the actual barrel contact the age of the barrels things like that we're not at that level yeah exactly uh but but un oak chardonnay which actually like you talk about um you know burgundy and you know old world chardonnay uh is phenomenal as somebody you know there, there's a saying abc anything but chardonnay yes uh a lot of that is it is fighting that california yeah. uh, stigma but the original chardonnay is it's incredible wonderful. and, and yeah. ours i feel is more in line with yeah. kind of the original so or... yeah we do an unoak yeah. chardonnay as well yeah and uh it just the fruit expression like if you're if you're doing a blind taste like it takes a while if you're not familiar with it you're not going to necessarily think it's chardonnay yeah um but to cycle back on where I where I was going, uh, um, so I've had friends that have gone and done like New Zealand and worked for some of the big producers. I won't name names, but th there was a bit of like just straight up diacetyl additions to their oak chardonnay, which mm -hmm. I'm not sure the legality of that and uh, <laughs> that, but like it was like from the brewer's perspective, it's just like gross. <laughs> like, yeah. Why? You know. It's one of those buzzwords. You yeah. know, you don't want to touch that. Uh, question from Paul. Uh, he's got two questions. Let's go with this one first. How many times can you use the bourbon barrel, and then what do you do with it? So, uh, bourbon barrels. Um, this run is the second run on that barrel. Um, that's actually kind of why I scaled it up from six months to uh, one year, um, primarily just because you 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 lose a bit between each each. Uh, because you're getting it, it just, uh, you know, permeates into the beer itself. Mm -hmm. When you pull that out, you're losing a lot of that character. So you kind of extend it out, and eventually you'll hit that point where it's like, you can't really pull much off of this mm -hmm. anymore. Sorry, i got to look at the camera rather than you while explaining this. But, um, yeah, you... you uh, I want to know. You kind of hit the you hit these uh, levels where um, you're not getting as much character as you wanted out of it. So you just got to send that out to pasture yeah there's going to reach a point what if we just say like five by five years if, if not sooner where it's it's really just a vessel yeah like a plastic i'd say yeah. even for us sooner like yeah. and what i've done is kind of like do a planned scale down like i have one potential beer to go in those three barrels that i emptied they're kind of sitting i sprayed them out and they're sitting right now and potentially there might be, I just got to kind of get approval on that, but there might be something that goes in there. But I probably won't put another Dobbelbach in that just because I want to keep Fossenbach a bit more in line. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's the, there is the excitement of every year Fossenbach being very different. Mm -hmm. I just don't want the Fossenbach to be, to hit the end of that two years and be like, well, we didn't really get much bourbon on this batch, but we're still going to call it Fossenbach. And I don't want to do that. No, no, no. Uh, great pride. Mr. Eric takes here in the beers and, and what they're named. So the two-parter of this, uh, kind of a Pokemon-esque question. What's the best way to capture wild yeast? Oh, I don't do much of that. Um, I'd recommend there is, though, uh, look up Milk the Funk, M-I-L-K the Funk. It's a uh, whole uh, conglomeration of people and uh, uh, brewers, both uh, professional brewers and, like, just people in there house like just figuring things out 
and it's a really great cross section. So if you want to harvest wild yeast, look that up definitely. Yeah, um, and uh, always a very interesting topic of conversation yeah. because you really, you know, and I, I actually I think we talked about this the, the yeah, first time we did that. You, especially when you get to a certain size and there's a certain expectation, you can't exactly risk a yield, a complete yield, by going with a wild yeast, which could really mess yeah. things up if it's not done correctly. I or, mean, like, and the other thing is also that, like, us being a winery more than more first, I like, I always keep in thought, like, the winemaker's perspective on this. Um, I don't want to risk bringing Britannomyces into this building. As you can see behind us, we have a wall that's wood. I mean, Britannomyces is a wood loving yeast. It will just kind of impregnate and it'll become part of your facility, you know? So I don't want to bring that in here and uh, risk uh, all the work that our winemakers are making or doing. That's well said. That's well said. And, you know, there's certain areas that even now, like I, Southern Rhone is one place in particular where you're, you're going to see it more often than not because it's so pervasive and, you, yeah. you know, yeah, it's, it spreads throughout those areas. But uh, it's interesting. It's definitely, um, you know, I think at places that experiment with it uh, here, even here in the Finger Lakes, uh, there's places that do great things with it. Um, yeah. There's things called a pied de couve, which is like you harvest grapes early and you get that gr those grapes starting their own yeast and then you yeah. add that to the wine. It, it all sounds great. But again, like when something goes wrong, it goes yeah. wrong to a level where well, I, I, I get weird about even souring our beer here um, because you're bringing lactobacillus into the facility. Like, so my first job out of college was ac actual winery and I worked for a really great winemaker on par with these guys. Um, he flipped out when my cellar mate uh, brought yogurt into like yogurt for her lunch. And it was just like one of those things. What are things, you doing? Like, what are Get you that doing? Get out of here. Yeah, like, don't bring that in here. Don't bring yogurt in here. go Which, outside. Yeah. <laughs> ah, go uh, but yeah. My kids are getting into go now, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, completely <laughs> torpedoed what you were going to say there, talking about Gogurt. That's the challenge of drinking these 10 percenters. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. We're having a great time here. Wayne, Wayne's leaving us. Bye, Wayne. <laughs> uh, no, but we're, we're wrapping up here. We just hit an hour. Uh, if you have any questions, obviously, let us know. You can throw them in there. You can throw them in after the fact. We can get to them, too. Yeah, I got uh, a bit of free time. I can answer questions. Exactly. We got some free time here. Uh, let me lay out the schedule for you guys for these virtual tastings moving forward. Now, next week, uh, I know I'm going to jinx it now 100% by saying I'm hoping to be out in the vineyard again. So, sorry, it's going to snow next Friday. But uh, <laughs> they are planting the new Cabernet Franc block. Ten acres of Cabernet Franc is going up, which is going to put us over 225 acres total uh, of grapes that we're farming here. But they're going to be starting that this week. We're hoping that we're going to get some live footage of them planting Next Friday, at the very least, we'll record some of it, we'll show it, we'll talk with John about that process and about how you nurture a brand new vineyard. I think that's going to be very interesting. Uh, other topics that we have coming, uh, everyone's favorite, John Poulos, uh, crowd favorite. He will be back at some point. Also, uh, I think the one idea we're bouncing around is talking about just bottle shape and what that means and, and the history behind all those in different places around the old world, but also why we have so many different bottle shapes as well at Wagner Vineyards. And at some point, uh, we're gonna start to slow these things down a little bit uh, because we will be open again. We will be welcoming people back, but we're not gonna stop them by any means. So if you have more ideas, please leave them in the comments. We love to hear them and we love to consider them. And we will let you know moving forward what that schedule looks like. Oh, and then we have the uh, Think New York uh, happy, hour. Yep. happy Hour. That's great. happy hour. So uh, Wednesday, the 27th of this month, uh, we'll be back live on the Wagner Valley Facebook page. We'll be doing a uh, New York Brewers Association sponsored event uh, tasting here. We're hoping to be outside again. Yeah, we just jinxed it, yeah. knocking it on some wood, uh, which is gonna be a really interesting interesting discussion. If you've been following the, the Think New York, Drink New York, uh, it's been really interesting to see people really throughout the entire state and seeing their stories. So that's gonna be a, a good way for us to give you all of the background here, all the background on this individual as well. Uh, and we're gonna taste some great beers. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe, maybe we'll pop open some of those barrels. We'll see. Yeah, exactly. I'm, maybe I'm maybe we will. Yeah, we can <laughs> get the wine thief out. We can uh, get some of the secret projects going, you know. Excellent. All right. Well, 
that's going to do it for this show. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, of course. We'll see you next time. And uh, any last words while I hit end video? Uh, wear your masks, guys. Like, just do it. Be safe. Just do it. We'll oh, see you soon. We'll see you soon.